We appreciate it. Um, Kate, do we have all of our panelists promoted to? We sure do. Okay, sorry. I don't know why um, you didn't automatically get put into panelists, but I'm glad that you took care of that. So, okay. Um, so, Kate, if you'll stop and restart the recording, we can go ahead and turn things over to that our panel. Done. Perfect. All right, so whoever wants to share their screen first, you, you ladies can take it away. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. We're really excited. Let me, uh, oh, I don't have my video on. Let me make sure it works. The computer's been squirrely today. So am I there? There I am. Okay. It looks good. Awesome. Is this, um, is so we're really excited to be with you today um, to talk about something that's near and dear to all of our hearts who worked on this project. Um, is sharing thoughts about accountability, more specifically academic integrity and ways that we can promote it, ways that we can monitor it, and then ways that we can deal with it when, when students have not been upholding integrity. Um, so that's how we've kind of broken up the, the advice that we have today. I'm going to start off. I'm Christine Masters. I'm the Assistant Dean in the College of Engineering for Academic Support and Global Programs. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some messaging to students about upholding integrity. Then I'm going to pass it off to um, Brandy Robinson from the Department of um, Energy and Mineral Engineering to talk about some specific tips in Canvas and other tools that help promote and monitor accountability. And then from there, we're going to pass it off to Yvette Richardson, um, also from the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, to talk about our process and things you do once you um, find that a student has violated integrity. We're going to try and go pretty rapid fire because we really want to make sure that we leave time for questions and answers um, to hear from you all to, um, about what we've had to say or other things related to academic integrity. So. My part, it's about setting the tone. And, and what I'm showing on the screen are just a few examples of, of a syllabus that I used to help really clarify um, w telling the students not only what to do, and I think this slide might be animated. So if you want to just click through it, you'll see the green, yellow, and blue boxes come up. But what to do, how to do it, and why to do it. And so in my syllabus, I had five different elements, read, attend, practice, check, and show. And I had one of these sets of boxes around each of the things. And I was trying to highlight for students what I'm asking them to do specifically. I was asking them to read the textbook, answer a couple of questions, how they were supposed to do it, highlighting both how to do it and how not to do it. So for example, in the reading, I asked them if they were answering a definitional question. If they put exactly words in from the textbook, that's fine but they needed to make sure they cited that because they shouldn't be taking credit for other people's work. And then the third piece was to make sure it was telling them why I was having them do it. I, it boggles my mind that students think we sit around in our offices with nothing better to do than to invent things to make their lives miserable or to cause them work so presumably they're not out doing other things. Um, and, and we all know that's not the case. And I would often joke with my students, I could just have give you two exams and a final, nothing else. It would make my life so much easier, but I don't think that would be good for you. I don't think that's what you want. And then they would shudder a little bit and go, no, 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 keep these extra assignments. Um, so going to the next slide, it's, it's not just about telling them what to do, but it's also about reminding them throughout the semester. This can't be um, a one shot conversation, a one paragraph in your syllabus. You, you should be constantly giving them um, examples, tangible examples of what you expect and that you expect different things on different kinds of assignments. And so if you go ahead and click again, there's a, a highlight box here. I instituted a, an integrity statement that I just wanted them to write on everything they did, success with integrity, that kind of then reminded me to keep talking about it and reminded them that it mattered even on um, what's showing on the screen now where in-class problems that they were going to work on together. They weren't even graded. It was sort of how I took attendance, but they needed to work together with each other. And so um, I wanted them to remember that even in signing their name on this worksheet, that should, they should be um, understanding that they were contributing to the conversation of what went down on that paper. Um, so the, the continuous conversations, um, I, I would have the line on my exam too, only I stopped feeding them the words success with integrity and just said, write down our integrity statement. 
some students came up and said, well, if I don't write that down, does that mean I can't turn my exam in? It's like, no, you can turn your exam in, but if you're reluctant to write that statement, I might look at your exam a little more closely because I will question why you're not willing to, you know, put that mark down. Okay, go to, to the next slide. Um, and the last thing that I want to remind all of you is that there's always ties you can make to your field. Um, students need to understand that this isn't just about monitoring how they conduct their assignments in college, but it's tied to a broader practice of always being mindful of how your actions and how your decisions affect um, the broader population and affect your, your character and your reputation. And so tying to your professional code of ethics or, or just professional standards in your field is really important. And so with that, I will hand it off to Brandy. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I'm Brandy Robinson and I teach in the energy and sustainability policy major, um, which is offered only through World Campus. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit um, today about ways that I use Canvas to help ensure the academic integrity in my courses, and not just for the courses I teach online, but also my residential courses. So one of the first things that I do, and I think this ties along nicely with what Christine was just saying about setting the tone, is that as part of the orientation materials for every one of my classes, um, I require students to submit proof that they have successfully completed the Penn State Academic Integrity Training which is available at academicintegrity.psu.edu. And a couple of uh, semesters ago, we worked with the folks who manage that to, to be able to make students have to log in to complete it so that they could generate these certificates. And so I have an assignment Dropbox that's part of the orientation where they need to submit um, the proof that they've completed this training. And this comes in handy down the road if I do end up having an academic integrity violation of some sort, I can point back to this and say, not only did we talk about this in the syllabus, but you completed academic integrity training, which tells me that you understand that X, Y, or Z that you've done is, is in violation of that policy. And um, I don't grade any work they submit for the class until they've, until they've um, completed this. So, okay. Um, here. All right. And then the next thing, and this is perhaps the biggest thing that seems to surprise my colleagues when I talk to them, is that, you know, the default assessment settings in Canvas are not robust. So if you just go in and generate a quiz quickly, um, the default settings will be that it will show students the correct answers immediately upon submitting. And so this sort of this sort of opens up a can of worms, right? And can lead to situations where you have one student who will take it first and then give the answers to a friend and then they'll switch back and forth from assessment to assessment. And more importantly, I think students, when they see something like that, assume that that means that the instructor doesn't really care if they cheat that way. That it, well, I mean, if I can see the answers and tell them to my friend, they must not care. So just something to be aware of that if you want to make sure that you're you're not letting students see the right answers until everyone has submitted until the deadline has passed those are settings that you need to go into the actual assessment and and tweak um, in addition to that you want to make sure that um, you are scrambling the answer choices and questions sometimes depending on the assessment and the class size i'll only show one question at a time things like that. So there are little changes that you can make within some of the assessments in Canvas that can help shore up the robustness of the assessment itself. Um, and then I have a link down here to um, a Canvas community forum um, with some other best practices for, for maximizing the security of your quiz settings. And then a lot of the classes that I teach are writing intensive, so I deal a lot with um, issues of plagiarism and inadequate attribution of sources and things like that. Um, again, following on what Christine is saying, it's important throughout the, the course to be, to be setting that tone. And so here within the directions for an exam, I remind them that, you know, academic integrity is important in this class and that I take it seriously and that violations will be, will be handled at the college level. Um, 
And so, you know, I have noticed in the time since I've implemented that academic integrity quiz and since I've started integrating things like this, that um, instances of sort of blatant cheating have, have kind of disappeared from my classes. I think students, they realize, well, if this instructor is going to take this seriously and be on the lookout for this, so I need to, I need to be mindful of that. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about in terms of ways that Canvas can help you um, ensure academic integrity in the assessments is using the Turnitin integration. And this is, this is really handy. And uh, um, I've, I've gotten a lot of use out of this. So it used to be the case that I would have to manually upload assignments that students submitted to Canvas and before that Angel. Um, to have Turnitin review them for similarity with other submitted work and the internet in general. But now you can turn it in as part of your Dropbox in Canvas, which is really handy so that when I go in then to grade it, I already can see the sim similarity scores and go in and look at those carefully. So I did a couple of screenshots here that show what it looks like. Um, this was for a writing assignment. When you when you have turn it in turned on the one kind of small detail that I'll mention is that when you have the turn it in integration turned on, if you have a rubric for that assignment, the rubric will not display as part of the assignment. They can still see the rubric in SpeedGrader, um, but it won't display here with in assignment instructions or anything. But it's it's really handy. And then if you just click on that percentage it takes you right to the Turnitin similarity report. And for those of you that maybe are not familiar with what a Turnitin similarity report looks like, here's an example of one that was um, pretty heavily borrowed from uh, some outside sources. And so it does a nice job of showing you what they took from different places. And those are hyperlinks then that you can go to to review just how similar it is. So um, and then one last quick thing I'll mention is that I just had this come up this week where for Canvas discussions, you can set the discussions to um, not let people be able to um, read others' posts until they've posted themselves. And I've had an instance with a student plagiarizing another student's um, discussion posts in one of my grad classes this semester, actually. And so I'm going to be employing that for the first time uh, moving forward next week. I've never had to do that before, but that's one other little bit that you can you can tweak in Canvas to make sure that um, people aren't cheating. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dean Richardson. Okay, thanks, Brandy. So hopefully, with with all of that preparation and setting up a, a culture in your course, you won't have very many violations. But if you do, we did want to make sure you know what you should do. Um, in that case. So if you suspect that a student violated AI, the process really is to first discuss the issue with the student. Um, make sure you know, make sure that they know what, what exactly it is you think that they did. Um, sometimes there is an explanation, a lot of times there isn't, but having the conversation is important. If you still believe there was a violation, then you fill out the academic integrity form, which I'll show you um, in just a minute, indicating your desired sanctions. <clears throat> and then on the student side, the student can then either sign the form accepting both the allegation and the proposed academic sanction, or they could accept the allegation but contest the sanction if they think it's too severe for what they the nature of what they did. Um, and that would then invoke a review by the College Academic Integrity Committee. Or they can contest both the allegation and the proposed sanction, which again would um, then invoke a review by the College Committee. Can we go to the next slide? So this is the academic integrity form. <coughs> And um, you know, the first boxes are straightforward. Um, can you click once, Brandy, to bring up the box? Yeah. So in box five, there is where you give a description of the alleged violations. And 
and attach any supporting documentation. So that could be something like the Turnitin report that Brandy just showed or copies of two students' exams showing how similar they are. Whatever evidence you have, um, the more that you, the more thoroughly you provide that, the easier it is for the college committee to evaluate it. So the supporting documentation is pretty important. Then can you click again? And then in boxes six and seven, are the proposed sanctions. So the proposed academic sanctions there could be you know, a zero on this assignment um, for something more egregious. Maybe it would be a, a change in the, the grade, the overall grade for the course. And there are some guidelines for that um, that are part of the, the G9 policy. Um, so th there's some helpful guidelines to think about. Number seven is the recommended disciplinary sanction. And so that, that goes on their student conduct record. Um, and that generally is for the more egregious cases. Different colleges handle things differently. Some really bring those in when there are priors. Others um, may use it a bit differently. But um, can you go to the next slide, Brandy? And the terminology here is, um, maybe not familiar to a lot of faculty, but academic sanctions are consequences affecting the course grade. So zero on the assignment, reduction of the letter grade, and again, there are these guidelines um, to help you think about what, what you might want to suggest for that. And then the disciplinary and conduct sanctions really more affect the student standing as a Penn State student, putting them on warning, probation, um, in egregious cases, they could even get a notation on their transcript for the academic integrity violation. And these are really um, sent to the Office of Student Conduct who makes the determination as to what they are. We can recommend what we think they should be, but that's really in the hands of that office. Let me go to the next one. Okay. So if there is a, a review, um, the format could be done through a hearing or a paper review, um, and that really kind of varies by college, but the procedures should be spelled out somewhere on your college website. If there is a hearing, you will be invited to participate if you want to clarify anything for the committee. Um, the committee decision, they will, will decide if a student is found responsible for the academic integrity violation. And it's important to know the standard of proof is more likely than not. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. And then the college will determine if the student has prior violations, which then might adjust the sanctions that are imposed. Um, at the end of that review, then you will be notified regarding the outcome of the hearing so that you know how you need to um, apply the sanction to the student's course grade. I think that was my last one. Yep. So with that, we are ready for questions. Hey, so Yvette, while we wait for a question, I'm going to go ahead and answer one from Jackie Schwab, um, just verbally, where um, she asks, how do you balance the teachable moment approach with students with the AI reporting process? Where do you draw the line? And I want to emphasize, and I was starting to type this out, but it got a little involved. Any time that you plan to deduct something from the grade because of a suspicion of academic integrity, you're required to submit the form. Um, it's actually the student, it's what protects the student's right to disagree and contest. And so while it often feels like doing them a favor by just giving them a small grade penalty, warning them verbally, and then not filing the form, it's actually undermining the whole process and the student doesn't quite realize that. Um, but one way you can really emphasize the teachable moment aspect of it is to keep the sanctions fairly reasonable and, and under the assumption that this is the student's first time through the process. I can tell you from my own college, there's data to support that that's most of the time the case. I think about 85% of our cases that come through our college are, the student does not have a prior violation. Um, and I know some instructors are reluctant to make it a, a low grade penalty. So if it's a homework assignment, giving a zero for that assignment because you don't 
trust that it was a student's own work or giving a zero on that assignment and a slight overall grade deduction as a penalty for having tried to get away with something rather than an entire letter grade reduction because you found cheating on one homework. Um, but you can trust that the system will catch students who have more than one violation. And that's really important because a lot of instructors think, well, this is just really minor. It's not worth that many points. It was probably just a weak moment. But I can tell you the students learn a much stronger lesson knowing that, that this is now on file for them. And if the student is doing this in five or six different classes and each instructor is cutting them a break by not filing the form, then we have no way to identify that pattern of behavior. And the student isn't really put on notice in the same way that they are when, when we follow the process. But the bottom line here is that if you're sanctioning the student at all, for any kind of grade deduction related to academic integrity, you, you really are required to submit the form. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes also there's some ambiguity from a student's perspective about, particularly as it relates to citing sources, that feels like a, lot, a gray area for them in terms of paraphrasing and when they need to use quotes and things like that. And so over time, I've sort of taken some of those more common Rip ups that students have, for example, you know, putting a big chunk of verbatim text and then a parenthetical citation with it with no quotation marks of any kind to indicate that it's not their own words. I've put examples like that into my orientation quiz questions so that so that then that sort of negates the ability if a violation comes up for the student to say, well, I thought I did it right. I thought that that was enough. I thought that that was okay. Um, and so that, I, I think that that helps too, because, it, you know, having been on this, um, the college's committee for a while and hearing a lot of these cases, the one thing I've learned over and over that is more surprising to me than I ever expected it to be is that these things are almost never cut and dry. You know, something that on the surface you would think, well, either they cheated or they didn't cheat. This shouldn't be hard. It's never the case. It's always really complicated. And so I think anything that we can do on the front end as instructors to try to clear things up and make our expectations really, really clear saves us trouble down the road. Mm -hmm. um, so Brandy, there was a question I thought that you might be able to answer. The question yes. is about plagiarism discussion posts. It says mm -hmm. students have the option to edit a discussion post after they submit. Is there a way to turn that off? Oh, I don't know. Like I said, this, this problem with plagiarizing each other's discussion posts has never, I've never okay. caught it before anyway. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time I've, I'm going to have to try to tweak things. I don't know if you can turn off the editing. Maybe Jane would know that the answer to that. But um, yeah, and the other thing I wondered about that, you know, my plan is to, to enable that feature where they can't post, they can't see other posts until they've posted. But I don't think there's a way around them just posting um, like one little tidbit that then gets them in so they can see stuff. You know what I mean? They wouldn't necessarily have to post their full response to whatever the prompt was in order to open the gate. So gotta gotta sort that out. But and I will say um, too that turn it in is not perfect. So when the when the student who was plagiarized brought this to my attention this week, I I was really surprised because I copy and paste and run my discussion posts through turn it in. Um, and Turnitin did not, the student had changed the words just enough that like she was still basically copying the first student's entire meaning and, and stuff, but Turnitin wasn't able to see the similarity in the words. So it's a, it's good for catching egregious stuff, but it won't, it won't get everything. So there's a important question about turning in the form in this remote environment. Um, and I noticed one person answered, thank you, George, for, for letting us know what you do in your college. I know um, many consider the PSU email address to be the confirmation. So if an instructor sends it to a student from their PSU email address, 
that that email coupled with the form can be acknowledgement of signing the form and the same with the student sending it back. So if they send back an email with a form attached that says I, I contest this or I accept this, um, that's, that's another way. And one thing that I think I didn't point out is that a student has five business days to um, contest the, the charge. Um, and if, if they don't reply at all, that is taken to mean that they have accepted responsibility. So we have somebody asking the question about um, having given exams for quite a number of years, but they've always been closed book and closed notes. And so now um, administering them in, online has you a bit concerned. Um, I, I know this has been a, a really heavy time for our learning design folks in supporting instructors, but it's also a really exciting opportunity to perhaps rethink the way that you're um, testing students. Um, so it's, it's, they've got a lot of great tools and suggestions that can help um, rather than imagining clamping down, giving an assessment exactly the way you've always given an assessment, um, rather flipping that around and saying, is there a different way to test the student's knowledge that gets more directly at, at what they know and, and then also makes it less likely to have integrity violations? For my, for my classes that are um, designed to be online, um, the assessments are sort of built with the assumption that I usually want them to be open book and I want them to be pulling in that information and utilizing that to craft their responses. Now, I'll caveat that by saying I teach in my online program mostly upper level courses that have a smaller enrollment and focus more on writing. And so it's easier to craft assessments that play well to that. But Spring, when we went remote, I was teaching a 200 person on campus gen ed class and had to think about my traditional multiple choice question exams and how to run those. And that was when I ended up doing Canvas exams that only showed them one question at a time. They were timed just like they were in class and didn't let them go back and forth. And I, to the best of my ability, built up a question bank so that nobody was really getting um, the same exam. And I, I expected the grades to be a lot higher. I figured people would figure out a way around it, but um, ev almost everybody in the class scored plus or minus 10% of what they had scored on the first exam in class. And the same was true with the, the third exam that we did remote. So I don't know if I just did a good enough job of, of really warning them that I was watching and that I was looking for stuff. Um, or if, I, I think also most people are just generally honest. I think that, you know, hopefully these, these violations are the exceptions, not the rule, so. There's a question on here about Chegg being a big problem in the spring and is there a collaboration? Um, we've had some extensive discussions with the uh, Penn State Legal about the act of removing course materials from Chegg. Um, the, the stance right now is that every individual instructor owns their content. So every individual instructor has the right to reach out when they see something of theirs on there to ask that it be removed. Um, but that oftentimes the damage is already done and the materials are already out there. We've also had some success at the college level of requesting the names and logins of students who posted things when they had specifically been told not to. Um, and so we've brought violations against some students who've done that. However, they're not required to use their school issued ID or their actual name in creating their Chegg account. So when we've gotten that information back, about half the students we could identify and about half the students we couldn't. Um, other instructors have tackled it by just acknowledging Chegg from the beginning and saying, don't use it. It's not that, that useful for your instruction because oftentimes things are wrong. And, and I have access to and will we'll find similarities in your work and that of others if, you, you know, if you're using work off of that. It's not an ideal solution, but um, that, that's, that's how folks are approaching it at the moment. We had an incident a couple of years ago with Course Hero in, a, in an EMS course where someone had posted a midterm from the semester before 
And one of the questions, I don't remember exactly what it was about now. I think it was related to which country's GDP was greatest or something. I don't know. But the answer to that question changed between the semester that the person who posted it to Course Hero took it and all the people who borrowed it from Course Hero took their exam. And so the instructor had this exam where dozens of people got a perfect score except for missing this one question. And so it was very obvious um, what had happened. But, and I, I don't know if this is true in other colleges, but in our college now, we have boilerplate um, standard language about um, course copyright and not, and students not being allowed to upload any course materials to sites like Course Hero or Chegg or things like that. Um, so that students know that not only is it an academic integrity violation, it's a copyright violation to do it. So there's also a question about whether PSU has an honor code. Um, we do not. Our, our, some individual colleges do. The question specifically calls out College of Engineering. We, ha we do not. I have been working with our student leadership to think about creating one. Um, I know some other colleges do have honor codes, though. The College of Communication does. The Snail College of Business does. Um, but that is certainly something that, as a university, we could be looking at. Um, related to that, there's a question about whether there's a central academic integrity office. Um, there isn't currently. There was a task force formed and a proposal written to the provost at, with just that suggestion of forming a central academic integrity office. But specifically to the rest of the question of does each campus have one, every campus and every college has an administrator that is the point person for academic integrity. I'm the point person for College of Engineering, Yvette is the point person for College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, and every campus has one as well. So in your, in your question, Marcus, specifically calling out Abington, there is an Abington um, academic integrity point person. In terms of where you report, it follows the course and not the student. So the course is offered by an academic unit, and if there's an integrity violation in that course, and a student contests, it follows the process for that unit. So if a College of Engineering student um, violates integrity in their chemistry course at the Abington campus, that follows the Abington campus process. If a College of Engineering student violates integrity in a chemistry course at University Park, it follows the College of Science pro process because that course is offered by the College of Science. And with that, I think we're right at time. These questions have been really great. I appreciate all of you who who have been here to join us for this discussion. <laughs> We're really excited to talk about this. It, it matters so much in every aspect of the university. And, um, and thanks for giving us the opportunity to, to talk about it. I also wanna give a shout out to Andrea uh, Raganes because she's the one who got me involved in the panel and, uh, and was one of our behind the scenes folks. So thanks, Andrea. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. We really appreciate you presenting. I don't know um, if you wanted to post your emails in the chat in case anybody has some follow up questions. Um, you can do that, but we are one minute over time. So um, I'll let you type that in really quick. There you go. So Brandy's information's in there if anybody wants to follow up with them. But um, other than that, we will see everybody at our very last summer series Canvas Day session next week. So thanks all for joining. Take care.